As we gather today on this Thanksgiving Sunday, we do so, I hope, with grateful and thankful hearts, acknowledging just how truly blessed we are in so many ways. And we are indeed truly blessed. We've seen the incredible devastation that Florida has endured this past week with a second hit in two weeks from powerful and devastating hurricanes. And who knew that with a hurricane could also come tornadoes? In fact, the deaths that have been recorded from Hurricane Milton weren't from the hurricane, but from the tornadoes that hit preceding it. And the people of, of Western North Carolina are still suffering from incredible damage and hurricane from Hurricane Helene just two weeks ago. An area, Asheville, which is maybe familiar to some of you, that is the, the home of the Billy Graham Association's ministry center, the Cove. And thankfully, it was not damaged extensively, but it's also the homestead of the Billy Graham family. And they have pivoted from dealing with, with from offering a, a ministry retreat to pastors to being a place for support and hope for the people who are suffering in Asheville. And we're thankful for all the testimonies of people sharing hope and peace in Christ in the midst of loss that, that we, we hear on the news, we read in the news. In the midst of such devastation, there are voices of hope, voices of promise, voices of, of care and concern and love for neighbor and for one another. And it's a reminder for us, all, every single one of us, that even in the midst of tragedy and suffering, God is present. And he is helping, working in and through the lives of God's people to bring hope and healing to a broken world. And if you say to yourself, well, that's all well and good for you to say, Pastor, but you don't know what I'm dealing with, and I don't really have anything to be grateful for. Think again. Think again. You can thank him for this place that we're gathered here this morning. Thankful for the heat that, that took the chill off this sanctuary. And if you, if you want to know how, how nice it is to come into this sanctuary on Sunday morning and have it a little bit warmer, come in here on Tuesday or Wednesday morning and you'll find out how cold it actually is in this, in this sanctuary during the week because we don't heat it when we're not here. We're blessed for this facility and, and for this gathering of God's people, this family of God here in this place that cares and, and truly loves and cares for one another and supports one another and encourages one another on our journey of faith. And if that's not enough for you to give God thanks and praise for, how about thanking him for Jesus? Because each one of us who are in Christ have God to thank for that. Because he sent his one and only son that all who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. That comes from John chapter 3 verse 16. Each one of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our lives are truly blessed indeed because somebody cared enough about us to share the gospel with us and, 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 and allowed Holy Spirit to work in and through us to the point of driving us to our knees and confessing our sin and asking Jesus to take up residence in our hearts and lives. It didn't just happen by osmosis. Sadly, that's what the cultural Christian church believes. I go to church, therefore I'm saved. 
I go to church, therefore I'm a Christian. We're saved because we accept Jesus' sacrifice on the cross as payment for our sin. And we give God thanks and praise for that. We do have things to be thankful for, to be grateful for. And I'm so grateful that Jesus came to, to, to show us the Father. To he, he, Philip, you know, there's always one. In, in the case of the disciples, several, you know, who said the, the incorrect thing to Jesus. Jesus says, I am the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Philip says, Lord, show us the way. Jesus came and showed us the Father. His, his character, his nature, his, char- his, his attributes, his love, his compassion, his kindness, his forgiveness that is available to each one of us. And he showed us the way to the Father. He didn't just say, figure it out yourself. Here's a book, read it. No, he actually took us and showed us the way, even to the point of laying down his life on the cross and shedding his blood for us so that we could have new life in and through him now and for eternity. So we do have much to be thankful for. And not coincidentally, God's word has a lot to say about being thankful as we will see this morning. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father God, we are truly thankful and grateful people. Lord, as we gather here, as we hear your word, as we sense Holy Spirit speaking to us, touching us, nudging us, speaking to our hearts, Lord, we pray, O God, that you would quiet within us any voice but your own in the name of Jesus Christ. In his precious name we pray, amen. So Psalm 107 begins what is referred to as book five of the Psalms. There are five books in the Psalms and some, um, they, they have different, different themes in those books. Some are laments. Book five is predominantly uh, Thanksgiving Psalms. And uh, which becomes very apparent when you get to the to the last part of of Book Five, Psalm one thirty onwards. I mean, they're they're basically it's a on, an ongoing hymn of of thanksgiving and praise. And Psalm one hundred seven is is a psalm of David's, and it picks up the refrain that he used in Psalm one hundred six and earlier. In essence, to give the Lord thanksgiving and praise for his blessings, his faithfulness, and his steadfast, unceasing love. The goodness of the Lord is defined as steadfast love. The active helpfulness of the Lord to all whose God and King the Lord is. And the Lord's love and faithfulness is reflected in so many songs and hymns, such as the ones we, we have sung this morning. And as I was meditating on this passage this week, the words of the great old hymn, Now Thank We All Our God, were, were coming to my mind. This, this great old hymn written in 1636. I'm pretty sure none of you were around when that one came out. Um, 1636 by Martin Rinkert. And pretty sure you probably never heard of that guy either. I know I hadn't. But he wrote this amazing hymn. Listen to the words of verse 1. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices, whose wondrous things has done, in whom his, his world rejoices. From, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. 
We gather today to worship and to give thanks to the one true God, the one and same God that Rinkert wrote almost 500 years, about almost 500 years ago. And indeed, people have been writing about even back to David's time and before. When we read in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, verse 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, it's true. The same God that, that, that Rinkert was writing about in 1636 is the same God that we worship today. The attributes that Rinkert mentioned in that opening verse of that great old hymn are the same attributes that we worship today, that we recognize in God, because He is unchanging in character. His attributes from beginning to end, indeed His faithfulness and steadfast love endures forever. Paul concludes chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, a chapter speaking about the love of Christ abiding in us, that, that agape love, sacrificial love. And he says, and now three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. The love of God revealed to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. And as we saw in Romans, when we were looking at Romans chapter 8 and verse 39, Paul says that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God revealed to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Nothing can separate us. So David writes in, in the first three verses of this beautiful psalm, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. For he has gathered the exiles from many lands, from east and west, from north and south. The refrain, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his faithful love endures forever, appears time after time after time in the Bible, in, in the Psalms, but also in other parts of the Bible. And it's it, it slight, worded slightly different, but one, uh, one person suggested there were as many as 44 different occurrences of this phrase in, in various forms, just in the Old Testament alone. But what is truly important for us to acknowledge is that we are to give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love endures forever without ceasing. God has always loved us and he always will. And as Paul encourages us, we are to give thanks in all circumstances. Read that in Philippians. We are to be thankful people, grateful people, because of what the Lord has done for us. Because he has claimed us as his own precious, beloved children. If we are in Christ, that is born again into the new life Christ died for us to have. And we accepted his sacrifice on the cross as payment for our sin. We're part of the family of God. And so David asks the question, are you redeemed? Well, in our context today, if we are in Christ, then the answer is yes, we are redeemed. In David's time, he was referring to a different notion, but set free from the bondage of slavery was, the, was what he was getting at with, with their enemies but we're set free from, uh, from the bondage of sin when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our lives. So we are, yes, redeemed. And in our, po our post-resurrection period, we, we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. And so then we're supposed to tell someone. We're supposed to tell the world the good news. We've been seeing that in Romans. 
We saw that in Romans chapter 10. Go and tell them. Because that's the only way they're going to be able to hear about it. Because I don't know if you haven't if you haven't noticed, but I certainly have. People are not breaking down our door to get in here to find out about the gospel. Right? We're not, we're not jammed to the rafters and having to have three services on Sunday morning because there are all these people clamoring to get into this God's house of worship to hear about Jesus. So if they're not coming to us, we have to go to them. And if we are redeemed, truly redeemed, part of our response to that, said Paul in Romans chapter 10, and David here, go and tell someone. Go and tell someone about Jesus. Go and tell somebody about about how your life was changed when you accepted Jesus. Go and tell somebody what a difference a life of faith makes in, in, in living in this troubled world, how it gives you hope and promise. It doesn't solve all your problems. It doesn't mean that you're not going to face struggles and difficulties and suffer, but at least you have hope. And it's a message we need to tell the world because the world is searching for hope. And sadly, as we are seeing in our world today, people are searching in, in um, how should I put it, alternative methods of an altered experience. And they're dying from that. Because evil is still present in our world, and there are evil people who are, st- who are lacing drugs with fentanyl and carfentanyl. And it's killing people. We have a message to share, friends. So the psalmist is saying, don't don't just sit on it. Don't just hide it in a bushel basket. Let your light shine. Let the world know that you have been redeemed. Big Daddy Weave wrote this powerful, powerful song called, called, I Am Redeemed. You will never hear me sing it here because I can't. You can hear me sing it in the shower, but not here. It is a very difficult song. It's easy to sing to in the shower when you're singing along with Big Daddy Weave. It's a lot more difficult to sing in the church when you're leading a bunch of other people to sing along with you. Um, I am not that gifted, so you're not going to hear me do it. Um, But it is a powerful song. And when you listen to his testimony that led him to write that song, Wow. I mean, it's right up there with, with all of the great old hymns and the testimonies that, that, that drove these hymn writers to write great hymns that are standing the test of time like Amazing Grace and others. Powerful, powerful testimony. We are redeemed. We have something to say. Because we've been saved by the love and grace of Jesus poured out for you and for me. And God has gathered the exiles, the redeemed from the north and south and east and west into his presence to give him thanks and praise, to worship his holy name. And so we read in verses 4 to 7, Some wandered in the wilderness, lost and homeless, hungry and thirsty, They nearly died. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble. And he rescued them from their distress. He led them straight to safety, to a city where they could live. We serve a providential God, friends. A providential God who hears us when we cry out to him in our distress. This psalm holds a a personal place in my heart because this psalm helped me, has helped me more than once in more than one season of darkness. 
Because I was that person who wandered in the wilderness, lost, hungering and thirsting for meaning, purpose, and hope. And I can tell you, it's not a good place to be. At the point of death. And I cried out to God for help. And he heard my cries and he rescued me. Maybe someone here this morning can relate to that same thing. So when I say we have much to be thankful for, I don't just say these words flippantly. I don't say it casually. I say that from the depths of my heart and my soul. Because God truly does not want to see us suffer. And he will help us if we will seek him with our whole heart. At the point of death, God restored my life. Now here's the bad news. (laughs) I shouldn't say the bad news. The challenging news. It wasn't instantaneous. We read and saw in verse 7, he led them straight to safety to a city where they could live. Oh, I wish that God had done that with me. But he didn't. It took time. In my mind, a long time for his plans to work out. And it was hard, very hard. But God heard my cries, and I placed my faith, my trust, my hope in him alone, believing that he had something far better in store for me. And he led me out of the storms with with his faithfulness. And when I felt like no one loved me or cared about me, He assured me that he did. He always has, and he always will. Personal testimony. I'm pastoring a church in Halifax. Hadn't met Susan yet. And I was in a dark place. And I, at that point, had not heard of David Jeremiah. But there was a Christian radio station in Halifax that I used to listen to occasionally as I would walk to the church. And one morning I was walking to the church and I they had his program playing on the radio. And he was doing a series called God Loves You. He always has. He always will. And for weeks, every morning, I listened to that program. And thanks be to God that he used somebody that I have only met Did we actually meet him? I don't think we did. We met his son, didn't we? Um, we Susan and I volunteered for, Billy, for um, uh, Turning Point worship evenings. And, but I think it was his son we met. I don't think we actually met David. But God used him to speak to me, to assure me that he knew the struggles that I was going through. He knew the difficulties I was facing. He knew the challenges that were before me. He knew how I was suffering. And he assured me through his word, the word of God, not David Jeremiah's word. He used David Jeremiah. assured me that he loves me. He always has and he always will. And I share this with you, friends, because sometimes pastors can 
can come across as like, we got it all together. Oh, we got it all figured out. We know what to do. We're pastors. We, you know, we're perfect. And we, you know, we know the Bible inside and out, front and back. We can quote scripture and we can pray and we can do all these miraculous things. Newsflash, spoiler alert, we're human. We're human. And I struggle with the same stuff that every single one of you do. Maybe in different ways. And thanks be to God that he used somebody, somebody that I didn't even know. I'd never even heard of David Jeremiah at that point. But somebody that I knew that spoke this word of hope into my heart. And reminded me that even if nobody else in the world loved me or cared about me, God did. And that carried me. For months, that carried me. And we need to be reminded that we are God's precious and beloved children. And that he cares for us. I mean, even Jesus says so in Matthew chapter 6. When he says, look at the birds of the air, how they, how they f- make nests and and eat from the fields. And how our Heavenly Father provides abundantly for them. How much more will He do for you, His beloved children? If God looks after the, be- the, 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 the birds and the animals and all of His creation, how much more is He going to care for us? And that's Jesus telling us that. That's not me. That's Jesus. His words, paraphrased. So you see, Jesus says, if our Heavenly Father provides abundantly for us, for the birds and the animals, will He not also provide even more so for us, His beloved children? And of course the answer is, of course He will. And does. Because he's a good, good father who loves us with an everlasting, steadfast, faithful love. And he will lead you to the city of life. And, 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 and friends, it may not be instantaneous. It may be a long journey that we are on before we get to that place. And it may be really, really hard but that doesn't mean that God has given up on you and it doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. And he will lead lead each one of us to the city of salvation and ultimately to the eternal city where we will spend eternity in his glorious presence, reunited with, with all who have gone before us. And so finally we read in verses eight and nine, Let them praise the the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Our Heavenly Father satisfies our hunger and thirst for hope and meaning and purpose. And our response is to praise him. Because our Heavenly Father is the giver of all good gifts, says James in chapter 1. He is sufficient for us. He is all, he meets all our needs. Because they are met in him alone. And there truly are no other gods but our loving God, creator of heaven and earth. The same one and same God who knit each one of us together in our mother's womb. And he loved us before we were even conceived. And he loves us now. And I've often said that we get it wrong by celebrating Thanksgiving one Sunday a year. Charlie alluded to this. He didn't even read my sermon before he said it, but (laughs) didn't steal my notes. But, I mean, truly, every day, 
It ought to be a time of thanksgiving and praise to Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Everything we say and do should be an act of thanksgiving and praise as we worship the Lord in spirit and truth. And I encourage each one of us, and I do use the word us, to find one thing, one thing to give God thanks and praise for every day and give him the glory. As the chorus of the song, 10,000 Reasons, we sang earlier, says so profoundly, bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Friends, may that be our anthem and prayer as we celebrate Thanksgiving with family and friends this weekend. And may that anthem be on our lips every day as we seek the Lord with our whole heart this day and always, knowing that he loves us with an everlasting love. He always has and he always will. Friends, happy Thanksgiving. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your word, which encourages us, enlightens us, gives us hope. We pray, O oh God, that the seeds that have been planted this day through the music we have sung, through the word proclaimed, Lord, will grow and bear fruit by the power of your Holy Spirit. Guide us and uphold us with your love and your grace as we enter into a time of fellowship following worship. And go with us, go before us and behind us, as we share a table together, as we journey through this next week, may everything we say and do be for your glory and lift high the name of Jesus, in whose precious name we pray. Amen.